here we go, all of the classes inside of this series are going to be held at this time on Wednesday afternoon for the next four weeks, over the course of which we're going to be covering a really significant chunk of the Millionaire Real Estate Agent book, particularly the models in which we use to run our business. Now, I'll give you a little bit of background into the Millionaire Real Estate Agent. Um, <clears throat> where it came from, why it's such an important piece of literature for us in this industry. Uh, uh, several years ago, um, Gary Keller, the uh, founder and uh, 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 chairman of Keller Williams, um, sat down to set out and really determine what sets real estate agents apart, right? How are the most successful agents as successful as they are? And so so we, he, he started a essentially a research project for what he thought was going to be a white paper, right? Um, and in the course of this research project, sat down with dozens of millionaire real estate agents, some of the top agents in the country, not just Keller Williams agents, but agents from, from all different uh, brokerages who do their business all different ways. And through the course of this, you know, first of all, he, he realized, okay, this isn't a white paper. This isn't a research project. Like there's a, there's a book in here. There's something really profound about the way agents are doing business that causes success. And um, he learned some pretty significant things, even though they all lived in different places worked in different types of markets, um, their businesses on the surface looked different. Their buyers looked different. Their sellers work, looked different. Um, how they spent their, their time looked different. How they spent their free time looked different. Like all of these things look so different about these real estate agents. The fundamentals of how they ran their business was really similar. And so inside of that, um, um, they were able to boil it down to a series of a series of models that are essentially universal, not just in real estate, but in business itself, right? And so these core fundamental business models are completely scalable and are the backbone of, of what, we, um, what we teach at Keller Williams. When we talk about being a business owner, we're looking at being a business owner through these models. And these are the models of the millionaire real estate agents. And so as we explore this together over the next couple of weeks, I want you to keep a couple of things in mind. Uh, this, this book was orig originally written and researched in the late 90s, right? Um, a lot of things have changed between now and then, but the fundamentals are still the fundamentals, right? This is still a football, right? Will always be a football. And, and this is still real estate. This is still uh, a business opportunity and that won't change. Um, some, of the, some of the strategies we use in the market today, some of the methods and messages in which we're communicating change over time and change depending on the, the, uh, the cadence in the market. But the fundamental strategies on how we run our businesses is is universal and unchanging right what was what led to success 20 years ago still leads to success today um, and so we're going to explore those models over the next over the next few weeks um, and you're going to learn how to how to implement these models in your business wherever it's at OK, so those are the two things we're going to we're going to tackle each week is we're going to look at what this model looks like for the millionaire real estate agent. And then we're going to look at the scale. How does this look in your business so that as you're growing, you're growing inside of the models of the millionaire real estate agent? So um, I, I trust that y'all will join me each week here at two o'clock as we explore this together. Um, and you'll need some tools each week. They're easy to come by, and I'll let you know what they are. Today, you're going to need a pen or pencil, uh, plenty of blank paper, right? A notebook is, is perfectly fine. You'll want your calculator today, and you're going to want your copy 
of the Millionaire Real Estate Agent. As we go through these models together, I'm going to give you some page numbers as well. So you can actually, you know, read along in your book or at least earmark those pages. When something strikes you as significant, you can you can dog ear those pages or one of my favorite tools, the mini post-it note. These are incredibly versatile. If you're at team meeting, you'll know they also double as a really awesome coin when, uh, when you need somebody to pick heads or tails, right? Um, so we're going to be diving in, we're going to be diving in um, today um, um, with those tools and a 30,000 foot view of the millionaire real estate agent business, right? And then we're going to be narrowing in on how can, how can you scale that model into your business, all right. Uh, sound good? Um, for those of you who aren't on camera, totally, totally get it. Feel free to use um, any of the hand gestures. You should have, um, you should be able to give me some roaring applause with your Zoom emojis um, or a thumbs up or feel free to use the chat um, for us to be able to, to talk back and forth. And if you're in a place, um, if you're in a place where, um, where you can, right, where you can uh, uh, turn on your, your camera. Um, eye contact feeds our soul, right? And we don't get nearly as much of it as we, as we should these days. So, um, so I'm happy to connect with you on that level. So today, what you're going to need, paper, pen, your calculator, and your MREA book. If you don't have an MREA book and you want to pick one up the next time you're in the office, feel free to do so. Bailey's got them at the front desk for you. We'll just put it right on your office bill. They're just 15 bucks. Okay. Let's dive in. So <laughs> what is the MREA really about, right? What is this book really about? And at its core, this is Gary's, you know, battle cry to the industry. Think big, aim high, act bold, and live large, right? Through the models you'll find in the Millionaire Real Estate Agent um, um, book, you'll, you'll find that those models allow you to do these things, right? Thinking big is actually a strategy and you can put numbers behind thinking big. Aiming high will ensure you always hit the mark. And there's a, a phenomenal story on page 21 and 22, which is a really great parable, uh, you know, uh, uh, about the the uh, um, uh, the farmer and his his son, and he's out in the middle of the night having to protect his flock of sheep from from a, a predator, right? From a wolf that's coming in, and he remembers his dad saying, "It's it, at night. It's really easy to miss your mark because you underestimate the distance and you aim low. So always aim high, and it'll sh ensure you hit your target. And when we look at our business, right, when we look at where we want to go next month, next year, over the next 10 years, that future can be dark and fuzzy, right? We're not exactly sure how to get there. We can't see the path clearly. It's dim. So we have to aim high. That higher we aim, the more we'll ensure that we're able to, uh, to meet our goals, right? And, and you have to back up that dream with the kind of action it takes to make it happen. And we're going to learn over the course of, of this uh, MREA study, what does it mean? What, what action do you need to take and how can you take bold action? Okay. It's all about models. Gary and the team learned early on that, that success is duplicable right? Because successful people are working off of successful models. They have a really solid foundation. And in business in general, there's not a lot of need to reinvent the wheel, right? Um, if you're able to model after others who have come before you, um, um, who've seen success in the areas that you want to, then you can add your, your touch, your own personal flair on top of that model. So often we get started adding our own personal flair and wondering why our success is inconsistent, why we have good months and then bad months, or, or why we can't quite keep up with our workload, right? How in the world do people sell 70 homes a year when, when I'm feeling stressed selling 12, right? 
Um, that's because we're, we're layering creativity on top of the models. And sometimes we need to come back in and, and have the opportunity to, to address that. Um, so page 35 and 38 through 38 in your MREA book explores the importance of having models in your business. And, you know, I, I'll tell you here, one of the keys inside of that is selecting the right models, right? Um, know that that your business will look a lot like the business you're modeled after, right? And so if you are modeling the success of your business off of somebody who is doing, you know, 36 transactions a year, then your ceiling is probably 36 transactions a year, which is great if that's where you want to go. But that's why this book is called The Millionaire Real Estate Agent instead of the 100,000 air real estate agent, right? These are the models of the millionaire and not the 100,000 air, right? These are the models that top agents are using for success that you can scale and duplicate to earn your way to wherever it is on that timeline you want to be able to go. What's going to happen when you get there? If this is your first time seeing this uh, illustration, go ahead and give me a response. Uh, give me a give me a thumbs up emoji, a thumbs up there, or a, or tell me thumbs up in the chat if this is your first time seeing this illustration. Because I'll tell you, the first time I saw it, it kind of confused the heck out of me, and I wasn't sure what I was looking at. Right? Hey, Jordan, you're at the firehouse today, aren't you? I am. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing good. Good to see you. Well, so, so what are we looking at here? Right. And I want you to follow the path all the way from the bottom. We started our natural ability. We look at our natural ability and we're going to call this our entrepreneurial style. This is how we show up naturally without, without modifying our behavior, without, you know, without much more than a little effort and grit. This is our natural ability right? For, for some people, this ceiling is, is lower on that. And for others, it's, it's much higher. But I promise you, there's a ceiling on your natural ability in anything that you choose to do, any endeavor that you take on in your world, right? Be that business or finance or in your relationships or personal development or even, you know, even tactical things. Like you have a natural ability as a chef and a hairdresser and an athlete, right? And we're all in different places, you know? Um, and so, so your natural ability will only get you so far. And then what happens? This is, we hit a ceiling. You'll see that first dotted line is your natural ceiling of achievement, okay? And whatever that is, right? Your natural ability as a chef, as a hairdresser, as an athlete, as a business person, as a real estate agent, right? You're going to be able to show up as you doing you the way you do you only so far. And then you're going to reach a ceiling. And what happens when we re reach that ceiling is we may feel a little discouragement, right? Sometimes, especially if we're new at something that, that we're attempting to do, if we're new at this endeavor, when we hit that ceiling, it's going to feel at first like, ah, I wasn't cut out for this, right? Um, this isn't for me, right? Um, you know, I'll tell you as a, just for an example, as a hairdresser, my ceiling of achievement is here. And as a chef, it's here. And as a business person, it's a little bit higher, right? Um, those aren't things that, that my natural ceiling of achievement is at the same place that there are some things that, that I feel um, come a little easier to me, right? Um, and that, that are, um, that I may be more naturally inclined to, to do and to do well. And those things that I tend to be naturally inclined to do, I, I have a little more excitement, enthusiasm around. I feel better around those, right? And so what happens inside of that cycle is I like doing the business piece a little more than I like cooking, right? So let's just, let's just call it what it is, right? I don't make dinner every night. Um, more power to you if you do, but my family likes to enjoy their meals. So they're pretty happy I don't make dinner every night. Um, 
So, so my natural ceiling of achievement is different. Now, now let's pretend it was the other way around. And I didn't like business so much, but I really liked cooking and I did well at it. I'd probably spend more time here, right? I'd probably get better at it. And so my natural ability would start to rise as I'm practicing and developing more skill inside of that craft. Does that make sense? So for a lot of people that can happen naturally inside of business too. You dive into it, you get a little better, you get a little more skilled with your scripts or your lead generation or your conversations and, you know, and you start to feel more comfortable inside of that. But even just being in it and having kind of daily repetition and practice, you're going to find a ceiling. You're going to find that place where you've hit the wall, where you're doing all you can and it seems like you're not getting results, right? Or where you're feeling discouraged or disappointed and, and one of two things happen there right? You're going to see that when you hit that ceiling of achievement and you, you feel that, that discouragement or, or whatever that is, that's kind of, kind of driving you back down in the business, right? It could be frustration is another common one, right? Like we're grinding our wheels and, and, you know, we don't seem to be getting anywhere. This happens at all different phases in your business. And, and one of two things happen. I mean, you're going to bump your head and naturally you're going to kind of pop back down. And that's what you see, see illustrated here. Some people choose at that point to get out of the business, right? To stop doing what they're doing. I personally, when I hit that ceiling of achievement in, um, um, in my culinary skills, I kind of get out of the kitchen and um, I, well, I don't call anybody anymore. I, I use my app and figure out what's for dinner, right? So that's what happens with my natural ceiling of achievement. Why? Because I don't have a desire to get any better there. I'm not looking to be a professional chef. It's totally okay that I exit stage left at that point. I don't need to get any better. I'm not going to. But in business, I want to be better. In my real estate business, when I hit that ceiling of achievement, uh, getting another job isn't an option. This is, this is what I've chosen to do, and I'd like to do better than, than what I've set out to. So that's where I start implementing models. That's where I need to start looking at what's the success of others who have come before me and let's implement that in my business and something happens there it's not going to feel very natural right this can be really challenging it's it's called being purposeful and when we become purposeful in our business and we're operating inside of successful models that may not feel like our own we're able to break through to that next level and in that journey what happens is they start to feel more like our own we get more practice inside of there. We start feeling more comfortable inside of those models and inside of that skin. And, you know, over time, rinse and repeat, you're going to hit another ceiling, right? And that time it might mean that you need a bigger model to get you through the next ceiling. Maybe you're ready to add your own personal touch on top of that model and add creativity. Maybe you need to create some efficiencies inside of there, right? And so you're going to pop back down again and then improve your models and be able to break back through. Um, in, in Keller Williams, we refer to this concept as moving from E to P. In fact, it's what's on my shirt, if you can see here, ah, moving from E to P. It's the breakthrough moment, going from E to P, entrepreneurial to purposeful. And models, having a successful business model to follow is one of the keys to moving from entrepreneurial to purposeful. And that's why what we're talking about today is so important. Um, so you can find this on page 38, um, um, the natural ability and achievement ceilings or that E to P cycle in your MREA book. So what are those models? As we roll through the millionaire real estate agent, you'll find that throughout the course of your business, there's four recurring models right? The first is the economic model. And that's where we're going to spend our time today. The economic model is all about, well, really what activities have to happen for you to be able to meet your business goals. Of course, that sounds simple. It's a, it's a little more complex than that, but not much, right? What activities need to happen in your world for those business goals to be achieved? That allows you to create the revenue you need to fund your business, right? It rolls into the lead generation model. Okay, so um, real estate is a contact sport, right? But it, it really takes two things to be successful. 
meet people and have real estate conversations, right? And if you're doing enough of those two things, then you're going to have the business you desire. Well, how much of those meet people in real estate conversations do I need to have? That's what we get to learn about in the lead generation model. We really get to dial down what are the what are the tactical pieces that allow you to to uh, to prospect, to develop, and to nurture more real estate relationships. So when we get together next week, we're going to be diving into the lead generation model, the budget model model where all of your money goes. Now, here's something that's really surprising. Even though all of those real estate agents that Gary and the team um, um, interviewed, all of them were different and had very different businesses. There was something pretty, pretty strikingly similar about what they did with their money, what they were able to keep and reinvest in their business, what their costs of sales were, and what their expenses were. Um, and so, so there's a model to follow for that, to, to keep your business in line. Um, you know, it's, it's a really interesting thing. We run into it all of the time. It's the just one more, right? I could add this expense to my business. And if I had just one more closing, it would cover the cost of that expense and it would be worth it. I'd get a return on my investment. Well, no one in this in this room, but I had a conversation with an agent recently who um, who has two jobs still. They they are dual career. They do real estate full time, and they have a full time job um, outside of real estate. And he said, Anna, I want to be able to step away. And for me to step away from my full time job, I need to close three deals a month. And I said, Wow, that's that's pretty aggressive, right? You must be giving up a pretty good job is what I was thinking. And we started diving into his business. And, you know, this gentleman made more than six figures last year in real estate. He made about $120,000 in gross commission income, still has a day job. And I thought, huh, I, think, I know a lot of people who would be able to step away from their day job at $120,000 in gross commission income. Let's dive a little deeper. Well, it turns out he actually spent about $60,000 last year generating leads, purchasing them from, from Zillow and Realtor.com and anywhere he could get his hands on um, when we put it all together, $60,000. So he spent $60,000 last year to make $60,000 and he did all of that work, right, to close the 10 or 11 deals that he had and still had a full-time job. Can you imagine that? right? How much more he could be putting in his pocket if he had an idea of where his money was spent. And here's the real kicker in that he had no awareness around it. He thought he was spending a couple hundred dollars a month to run his business, not a couple of thousand dollars a month. So that budget model, regardless of where you're at, right? Like I said, we're going to learn the 30,000 foot view. What does it look like for the millionaire real estate agent? We're going to dive in. What should your budget look like so that that's a scalable model as you grow your business? And the, the organizational model. Believe it or not, every single one of us is a small business owner. Inside of that small business, we all are running an organization and there's a model to that organization. That organization is going to be filled with other individuals, other jobs that need to be done. And if you don't have somebody else working in your organization, then you get to wear the hat for every single job that needs to be done. So, you know, if, if, you, just, if you just learned that you are now multiply employed, then congratulations, you are. You own every job in your business if you don't have somebody else doing it. Gary also will famously say, um, if you don't have a housekeeper, then you're a housekeeper. If you don't have a lawn guy, then you're also a lawn guy. If you don't have a chef at home, you're also the chef, right? Um, but when that comes to our business, if you don't have a transaction coordinator, you are the transaction coordinator. If you don't have an administrative assistant, you are the administrative assistant. If you don't have a showing assistant, you are the showing assistant. Now, even though I say that, it's not, it's not all a bad thing, right? That's a choice that we get to make and our business has to earn our rights into it. But every single hat that's available in our business, when we start out, we get the privilege of wearing, right? And we earn our way out of those. So we're going to talk about all of those different hats and those thresholds that you should be looking at for, for when to get help in your business when we dive into the organizational model here in a month. 
So um, you can find more information, page 120 through 128 for the organizational model. And you'll also see this picture. And I'm gonna, um, like, just like you, I'm following along in my book. So when we hop into the organizational models or to the, the four models here, they all work together. We start this conversation on the top with the economic number, uh, with the economic model. Those are the numbers that drive all of this, right? Um, and we're going to learn what those numbers are today. We're going to have a focus on our appointments and we're going to talk extensively about conversion rates and why they're important, right? But it leads into our lead generation model, which is how we prospect and market, what, what our database looks like and, and uh, having that focus on seller listing, right? They work hand in hand. Whenever I'm making a change to my economic model, I have to make a change to my lead generation model because what got me to say 12 transactions a year probably won't get me to 24. It's going to look different, right? Um, and likewise, um, the activities that get me to 24 transactions a year are going to yield a different result than the activities that get me to 12. So when I make a change in one of those models, they all become affected and their impact it rolls down into the budget model right? Where we're going to learn how to lead with revenue to make smart decisions for our business, play red light, green light. So we don't end up like my friend uh, with a, you know, 50% expenses in his business. That was just lead generation expenses. You add on all of the other stuff he does and, and the math just doesn't, doesn't make sense, right? And we're going to stick to our budget. These are going to be key indicators that let us know when it's time to make changes to our organizational model right? When, where, how do we bring others into our organization? What does that look like? Um, you know, what, what does that path look like when we do decide we need to hire talent? And then once we've hired somebody, how do we continue to develop that relationship with them so that, you know, so that they're excellent at the job that they do and we fulfill that, that, uh, that promise that we made when we hired them, right? So all of these roll together, right? And then when I make a change to my organizational model, what happens? I probably need to have that change reflected in my economic model because if I just hired an admin, my economic model should grow, right? I should be able to do more business. And then when, when I'm doing more business, how did I get there? Well, I likely had to generate more leads. So my lead generation model goes right? And that means I'm probably taking more listings and, you know, there's a, a, an expense for all of the listings that I take and I'm paying the admin, obviously. So my budget model is going to change, right? But that admin helped me grow my business so much that I can add another admin or I'm ready to add another agent to my team. And when I do that, I've got to go back to all of the other models and get alignment. So they're all connected and one drives the other. All right. Feeling good so far? Awesome, guys. Haley, I'm so happy I can see you. <laughs> All right. You ready to dive in? Okay. So for me, this is where it gets fun. Um, I kind of like numbers. Um, I don't tend to be very precise with numbers. I like round numbers better, but I really like numbers. I like the story that they tell. I like the insight that they give. And I know that numbers can sometimes be overwhelming, right? But the economic model, I'll tell you what, it's all about the numbers. And numbers are the language of our business, okay? So page, uh, page 130 and 132 are going, to, are going to share with you those three key areas. Those are your economic models. So the focus on the numbers you must hit inside of your business, right? If I do X, then I get Y. And if I want to have Y, I got to do X. We're going to focus on the appointments. At the end of the day, you're not ever going to close any business unless you get in front of a buyer who wants to buy or a seller that wants to sell and you ask for the business. That's an appointment. And we're going to focus on the appointments. And then there's, there's a, a skill level that comes into play as well and, and some other variables. 
those variables can impact your conversion rates, right? That conversion rate impacts how many, how many appointments you have to have to make it to the closing table. If my conversion rates are lower, I might have to have four appointments to have one closing. If my conversion rates are higher, I may be able to have one or two appointments to make it to one closing, right? So I've dramatically increased my income without having to increase the amount of work I'm doing when I work on increasing my skill level inside of those conversions. So we're gonna dial into those pieces today as well. What are the factors in the economic model? Page 175 through 176, this is like I said, 30,000 foot view. So we're looking at the millionaire real estate agent business. Okay, and if I am, if I am grossing a million dollars in gross commission incomes every year, um, then, then these, are, these are the numbers. If I want to net a million dollars, which means I wanna take a million dollars home, then these are the numbers that get me there, okay? It's all about, and we're gonna dive into this when we look at the budget model. It's all about what are my operating expenses, okay? Um, operating expenses. Think of these as lead generation expenses, right? If you're running Facebook ads, hosting client appreciation events, sending out um, um, postcards or flyers, right? Those are operating expenses. If you have a listing and you're taking photos or hiring a stager, that's also an operating expense, right? Um, if you're spending money on coaching and training, that's an operating expense. Um, if you had to pay to come to class today, that was an operating expense. You didn't have to pay to come to class today, but if you did have to pay for, for real estate training for your continuing education, those are operating expenses. And we're going to, we're going to dive deep into that in two weeks when we hit the, uh, the budget model, right? So we look at our operating expenses and our cost of sale. Cost of sale is a cost that's incurred simply because I, I did business and it, it wasn't optional. Now, some people look at, okay, listing photography um, as a cost of sale. If I take a listing, I'm definitely going to do photography, but here's the deal. You're paying for that photography, whether the house sells or not. So it's not a cost of sale. And you don't have to do photography. You should. This is by no means me saying, hey, save a couple of hundred bucks and don't get a photographer. Do. Do get a photographer, hire a professional. It's the best couple of hundred dollars you're going to spend in your business, but it's not a cost of sale. It's an expense. A cost of sale would be your split, right? Um, so you're paying your split to your brokerage. That's a cost of sale, right? If I sell a home, X amount goes there, X amount comes here. That's a cost of sale. To the millionaire real estate agent, or if you're on a team or have considered a team before, the leader of that team pays a, pays a cost of sale to the agent on that team when the agent does business. That's considered that the lead agent's gross commission income and then the buyer's agent, whoever's on the team, who's making 50% of that, that 50% goes out as a cost of sale, okay? So one day, as you guys are growing your team and you're looking at bringing somebody into your organization, that cost of sale is going to be whatever their split is when they close a piece of business, okay? So if they're going to go on a 50-50 split, then you've got a 50% cost of sale on that piece of business. Think of it this way. This is your business that you're paying somebody else to do. So it's your money and you're paying it out to somebody else. So that would be a cost of sale. All right. And at the end of the day, what you're left with is your net income. You could also think of your net income um, as your profit in your business. Now, for some people, this is this is what I pay myself. Right. Other people are going to reinvest a part of their net income on growing their business. Right. And that might not be a business expense. Um, um, so those are some things to consider. You'll see the percentages there. 30, 30, 40. For a business that's netting a million dollars a year, that's what those numbers look like, right? That's the model. 30% becomes an operating expense. 
30% becomes a cost of sales. And then 40% is your million dollar net income, right? And that's the model of the millionaire real estate agent. And we're going to explore that. What does it take to do a million dollars in net income? And then we're going to dive into what is your, um, what is your economic model look like? So high level overview, a million dollars of net income. I want you to look at this and read it from the bottom up. You'll see it on one page 178 on your book, but we're going to start at the bottom and work our way up. If I have a million dollars in net income and that's 40% of the money I made, then 30% is 750,000 and 30% is 750,000. Those are my total cost of sales and operating expenses. Okay. Let's say my business is split completely evenly and half of our buyers and half our sellers. Well, then that means that I need to do 1.25 million in gross commission incomes from both sides. And to actually net a million dollars um, after expenses and cost of sale, I need to earn 2.5 million in gross commission income. Okay. So um, um, high level, taking home 40% of your income there, right? And th those are the numbers for the, the net a million economic model, right? So we know what it, what it takes to do that business. And now we get to look at those conversion rates, right? Inside of it. That's the next component of the economic model. First, we have the 30, 30, 40, right? That's where your money goes. And then we have the conversion rates. And that's what happens at each turning point in the transaction. And we start with, if you start at the top and you work your way down, when you go on an appointment, how often do they say, yes, I'll work with you, right? You go meet with a buyer or meet with a seller. How often do they say, yes, I'll work with you? And you can see in the examples of the net a million agent, um, that number 75% on the listing appointment, 70% on the buyer appointment. When we dive into your numbers, I'm going to share with you how you determine what your percentage is. Okay. Okay. So the next conversion. All right. They said they'd work with me. I put the sign in the yard. It's on the MLS. We're showing homes, whatever that is. How often do you make it to the closing table? What is your fallout rate? Right. So as you go down, you're looking at, okay. So in this example, it's a 70% success rate on each side. So they're seeing 30% in this example of their business is falling out for the millionaire real estate agent. And then you end up with your gross commission income. So those conversion rates play a really big role inside of this. So um, what does that formula look like, right? Well, we're going to start with what do I want my net income to be? In this example, my net income is a million dollars. So we just learned that that means I need to do two and a half million in gross commission income if I'm if this is on that 30, 30, 40 model. So 750 become operating expenses. If in this model, their gross or their average commission is $7,000, they need to sell 350 units to make this happen. Half of them are going to be sellers, right? So 175 will be sellers that need to sell. 70% of the time they make it to the closing table. So they need to actually have listing agreements with 250 sellers. And if they need to have 250 sellers and 75% of the time when they're sitting at the kitchen table, the seller says yes, well, then they need to actually meet with 333 sellers that year to make that net a million dollars. 333, break it down the same way on the buyer side, 357 buyers on the buyer side. What does that mean? In this example, they need to go on seven listing appointments a week to make a million dollars, seven a week, and then have seven buyers, right? So those are, are huge numbers, but not as big as I would have thought. Seven a week, right? Listing appointments, that's actually kind of doable if all of the other things work out. And so, so that's the net a million model. 
You'll find it in your book, pages 131 and 183 walk you through the math and, and what's behind the math in that, but we're going to focus on your numbers. And this is going to look different because that's a lot to be able to consider inside of your business. And quite frankly, it, it, it can be a little confusing, especially if you're not at that million dollar mark. So we're going to scale this model. Okay. Remember, we're still going to focus on the numbers you must hit. We're going to focus on our appointments and we're going to dial this down into how many appointments we need to have every month. And then we're going to focus on our conversion rates. Okay. And so this is the place where all of those supplies I told you to gather are going to come in handy. I want you to have a piece of paper out. I want you to have your pen and I want you to, to grab your calculator. You're going to do this math with me. I'm going to walk you through it on the screen. Um, and then I want you to use your number to get the math. Okay. Um, all right. Here we go, guys. I've got to rearrange my, my screen a little bit, but can everybody see my whiteboard? Yes, awesome. Awesome, 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 guys. All right, so I want you to set up your page the same way that I'm setting it up. Awesome, I see the thumbs up. All right, good, good stuff, guys. Okay, I, I want you to set up your page just like mine and draw four boxes on it. And I'm gonna ask some, some questions throughout here and then show you the, the math that I'm doing as we go. So, so in these four boxes, start on the right-hand side of your page, that very last box. This is the first number that, that, that we wanna know. And that number is our income. So in this box, we are going to determine what our, what our financial goals are, right? So that we can learn our numbers. So financial goals, um, you know, I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this easy. Your financial goal is going to be your own, okay? Your own financial goal. But for the purpose of an easy example, the financial goal here is going to be to be a hundred thousand air, right? I want to, I want to make, I, I need my num lock on my number lock. There we go. I want to make a hundred thousand dollars this year. Okay. So I'm going to make a hundred thousand dollars. And now the, the next question is, okay, do I want to make a hundred thousand dollars of gross commission income, right? Or net commission income. And for the sake of this example, we're going to say this is gross commission income. If I have enough closings to, to have $100,000 in gross commission income, I know that Anna, because we're learning about the budget models, I'm going to be able to keep my budget in line and, and my cost of sales in line. And I'm happy with what I'm going to make as a result of that. Okay, so $100,000 of gross commission income. So we need to determine, and that's going to be your next box over, how many closings does that mean I need to have? See, this is already easier than that pyramid, isn't it? It's just a couple of boxes. We're going to put a couple of numbers in it. Okay, so my gross commission income, and I'm going to put that on here. This is my GCI, $100,000 in gross commission income. Well, closings, what's the average commission right now? 
you know, um, it, it's, it's in our office, it's just north of about $12,000. Um, but, you know, let's just, let's just take some of the variables out and say, it's about a $10,000 commission. So, so I want you to, to take your average, or I'm sorry, your GCI divided by your average commission. Okay, so in this example, it would be that $100,000 divided by 10,000. And so that equals 10 transactions or 10 closings. And closings. Okay. Now remember that first conversion rate. And that happens right here. Because these are I'm going to call them seller or buyer listings. Why? Because that's the language they use in the millionaire real estate agent, seller listings or buyer listings. Okay. You might refer to these as signed agreements or agencies, right? So a question I would ask you is, okay, when you have a buyer or a seller that you're working with, how often are you making it to the closing table? And you may say, oh, every single time or nine times out of 10, or you might be saying, Anna, I, I haven't had buyers or sellers yet, or I haven't had enough of them to determine a statistical average. So, um, so, so what should I expect? And here's the thing that happens, right? Sometimes a seller starts packing their house and they decide not to move. And the buyer comes back at inspection and says, I want the world. And the seller says, no. I don't, I don't want to give you the world. And the buyer says goodbye. And the seller says goodbye. And I actually am going to take my home off the market, right? Or sometimes um, someone's getting relocated and then that doesn't happen anymore, right? Um, sometimes the buyer gets cold feet and they cancel in the contract. Or sometimes that home's not really a great home for them to purchase and they discover that during the transaction. So there's a lot of reasons after you go under contract that a buyer and a seller may not complete the transaction. So as a safety net here, a great statistical average is that 80% of the time you're gonna make it to the closing table. Always account for about 20% fallout. And in fact, we use that number on a larger scale inside of our office. When all of our agents are having transactions, we actually calculate that with an 80% fallout rate. So we expect that two out of every 10 are just not going to close because we are human beings, right? And, and life comes up. So we're going to take our number of closings divided by 0.8. And that's going to give us, dun, 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 dun. see, it was such easy math until now. So if we need 10 closings divided by 0.8, I actually need to have 12 and a half buyers and sellers, right? But I can't really have a half a buyer um, or a half a seller. So I'm going to, I'm going to round up and I know I need to have 13. This year, I need to work with 13 buyers and sellers to have 10 closings. Okay. How are we doing so far? Are we following the math? All right. We've got that next conversion rate coming up. And this is at appointments. And so the question that I'll ask you here is, how often when you're meeting with a buyer or when you're meeting with a seller, how often do they sign here and choose to work with you? Right now, some variables inside of here, and I want to help you find out what your appointment conversion rate should be. Okay. If you're working with a lot of sphere of influence, if you are getting a lot of referrals from them, 
if you have a lot of past clients, if you only ever intend on working with friends or family, your uh, conversion rate is going to be much higher. It may be as high as 80 or 90% sometimes. Okay, let's say for, for this example, because I really like easy math, let's say that, you know, most of the people you're going to be working with are sphere of influence and, and uh, or a referral, and you don't have a ton of competition when you go on an appointment. So it's 75% of the time they sign up and say yes. But that's not the only place we get business, right? We are also prospecting for new business. We are also meeting with strangers in the general public to, to have real estate conversations. And the conversion rate with those non-relational appointments is much lower. If we look at, say, an internet lead, somebody who clicked on your website, somebody who, um, a, a Facebook lead, somebody you don't know who's not a referral, that conversion can be as low as 25% or one out of four times they meet with you. Why? You guys don't have a relationship. You don't have a, you don't have a testimonial going up in front of you. And they are almost always interviewing more than one person. You're not the only link they clicked on, right? They, they clicked through a few links. They're talking to a few people. So here we go. We've got 75% on the high end, 25% on the low end. Let's just for sake of this, say your business is going to come from both places and meet at the middle and say 50% of the time, they're going to say, yes, I'll work with you, right? So I want you to take your number of listings divided by 0.5 or easy, right, times two if we're at 50% as the conversion right here, right? So that's going to equal 26 appointments, right? So I'm gonna throw the conversion rates in the gaps here so that you guys all have them too. 50% here, 80% of the time here. All right, 26 appointments with a buyer or a seller this year. Remember, it's all about meeting people and having real estate conversations, right? Those are the real estate conversations. So, okay, so this means I have to go on 26 appointments a year to sell those 10 closings. Okay, to have those 10 closings. 26 appointments is going to get me 13 buyers or sellers signed, which will result in 10 closings, which in this example would result in that $100,000 in gross commission income. Well, we can break this down even further, right? Um, if you'd like to, you can divide this, right? By, in this example, let's say 52 weeks a year. And so we know that now we need to go on one appointment every two weeks or two a month. Remember, we're focused on appointments because that's what the MRE says. And now I know that, okay, so long as I'm going on an appointment every other week, I'm on track to make my $100,000 in income this year. I need two a month, two, my, two buyers or two sellers or a buyer and a seller a month or a seller who wants to buy, right? That takes care of all of that for the month. What if, what if I went crazy and I was able to go on an appointment every week? How quickly could I then double my business, right? What if I went on an appointment every week and I started getting really good here and my conversion rate went from 50% up to 75%, right? But I'm still going on an appointment every week. What happened? So you get to play with these numbers and determine what's the right economic model for your business and where you want to go. Uh, you are very welcome to take a screenshot 
of this if you'd like. Um, it's it's not it, there's nothing else. We're we're done. We got to we got to going on an appointment every other week to be able to make a hundred thousand dollars this year in our business, and it really doesn't need to be much more complex than that. And that's why I like breaking it down this way more than I like the big pyramid. Because I think that big pyramid is much more complex than that. When you're starting out in your business, these are the numbers that you need to know. And now your job is go get that appointment every other week or every week or, you know, for a month or whatever your number is, right? Go get that appointment. And that's where we dial in the lead generation model. What exactly does it take to get those appointments? What should I expect? How many, how many people do I need to have in my database? How many conversations do I need to be having to make this happen? And that is where we are going to go next week is in the um, lead generation model. So I'm going to pull this down in like five seconds. If you guys want to take a picture of it now, do that. Um, well, I got this up, I don't see the chat. So I'm gonna open it up here in just a second. There we go. Um, what do you guys think? What questions do you have? Feeling good? Feeling good, I don't have any questions. I love it. Haley, were you able to use your numbers and break it down? Yes, yes. Yep, and it, yeah, it all makes sense. So I'm averaging 1.23 appointments per week. So I think that's about five, a little over five per month, I guess. But yeah. yeah. Well, you can also take that number, you know, that um, whatever we have, that 26 appointments a year and just divide uh -huh. it by 12. Yeah, yeah. Right? And then you're gonna come up with your monthly number. Um, if you really want extra credit, mm -hmm. determine how many weeks you wanna work in a year. Right. Oh, yeah. My entire yeah. business plan is work is based on on 46 weeks a year. OK, I'm yeah, taking that's... six weeks away from my business. What does yours look like? And divide it by that number. OK, so I want to take six weeks away. How much do I need to do now? You know, how much work do I need to do now? Great. Yeah. Love that. Love that, guys. What else? Awesome. Mm -hmm. All right. Have fun with this. Make the math your own. Uh, remember, there's three things you need to know. Focus on your numbers, it's the conversion rates, right? And the numbers that you must hit. So, um, so we will see you guys next week for the lead generation model. Great. Thank Have you. Good afternoon. Absolutely. My pleasure.